Deepwater Horizon oil spill may affect coastal areas throughout the northern Gulf of Mexico, but it's the wetlands associated with the Mississippi River Delta that are perhaps the most critical due to their large aerial extent and importance to the economy of the United States. The Mississippi River Delta contains over 40% of the U.S. wetlands in the lower 48 states. These wetlands support commercially important fisheries, provide habitat for waterfowl and other wildlife, and protect several major ports and cities such as New Orleans. The oil spill has the potential of impacting a variety of coastal habitats, including marshes, mangroves, barrier islands and beaches, and seagrass beds. Scientists are assessing the extent and severity of impact of the oil spill in coastal habitats of the Mississippi River Delta. They have collected pre-spill information on the condition of the vegetation and soils for many pre-existing study sites throughout the area and are investigating how the oil will affect the wetlands and what measures might work to clean up the oil to minimize damage to the plants and animals that depend upon these habitats. There are a number of factors that will control the impact of the oil spill on the vegetation. For example, the type of oil spilled, the volume of oil, how weathered that oil is, and also whether the oil penetrates the soil or not. The major factor controlling the impact on the vegetation is whether the oil only comes in contact with the shoots of the plant or whether the oil penetrates the soil. As the tides and currents bring the oil into the wetland, it can come into contact with the shoots, causing in some cases only a slight discoloration of the leaves and stems, or it may leave a sticky, tarry, smelly residue coating the shoots. If this is all that happens, then the plant shoots may die, but the roots and rhizomes below ground will survive. The rhizomes are underground stems that are responsible for new shoot production every year. This is how these plants regenerate naturally each spring. The plants can then recover from the oil effects as long as there is no additional oil coming into the wetland to affect the new shoots. If the oil should soak into the soil and contacts the roots and rhizomes, then these below brown organs as well as the shoots will likely die. The roots and rhizomes contain air, like a balloon, and when they die they collapse. This results in subsidence or sinking, leading to open water. The excessive flooding due to lower soil elevations may then prevent plant reestablishment. Due to this oil's consistency, it's not likely to penetrate the soil and therefore not likely to kill the roots and rhizomes. However, repeated oilings over multiple events would likely kill the vegetation. In this scenario, each crop of new shoots would be recoated by successive oilings. Because the plants use up a portion of their below ground carbohydrate and nutrient reserves with each regrowth, over time these become depleted and the plants die, ultimately leading to soil collapse. Well, marshes are very fragile environments, and this is primarily because the soil is so soft. So any physical activity that would disturb the marsh soil, such as people walking across the marsh uh, during cleanup activities, or vehicles that might traverse the wetland during part of the cleanup, will have a negative effect on the, on the marsh. Any cleanup activity that causes erosion of the marsh surface, such as high pressure spraying, is unsuitable in this type of wetland environment. However, low pressure flushing of oil that is floating on the water over the marsh surface is an excellent way of herding the oil towards central collection locations where the oil can either be vacuumed or skimmed away.
We've heard a lot about the use of dispersants uh, lately. The use of dispersants in wetlands must be done very cautiously. At one time, the older style dispersants were extremely toxic to animals and they could definitely not be used. There are what you might call newer age dispersants which, which are much less toxic. And we've done some experiments testing the use of these dispersants on oil as it moves into a simulated wetland environment. And what we find is, at least from the standpoint of the plants, that this oil dispersant mixture has very little effect, if any, on the growth of the wetland plants themselves. But we don't have enough information on the effects of these dispersants on animals, especially those that you might find in the wetlands themselves. An effective way of removing large volumes of oil that have either coated the vegetation within a wetland or oil that is floating on the water over the wetland is burning. Uh, this is often called in-situ burning because the oil is burned in place. And the only thing that is needed to protect the below ground parts of the plant is a thin layer of water over the marsh surface during the burn. This method works particularly well with grasses that rapidly regenerate after a burn. Another method that's been recommended for oil cleanup is the use of nutrient addition. Uh, this has often been called biostimulation. Nutrients accelerate the activity, the de degrading activity of microbes, bacteria, and fungi in the soil so that the oil can degrade faster. In order for these microbes to be most efficient, they require both nutrients and oxygen. Actually, nutrient levels in the wetlands of the Mississippi Delta are relatively high, but what's lacking is oxygen. Uh, these wetlands are low in the intertidal zone. They uh, are flooded excessively, and so there's very little oxygen available in the soil. Therefore, just the addition of nutrients will not necessarily increase the degradation rate of the oil because it's not the nutrients or the bacteria that are limiting to degradation, it's primarily oxygen. The exception to this would be in wetlands on the backs of barrier islands, for instance, or other higher elevation wetlands that are just infrequently flooded. But in reality, the best option may be no action at all, especially if the marsh will recover on its own. It's difficult, I realize, for people to accept the no action approach because people want something to be done. If the cleanup has the potential for doing more damage than the oil itself, then it, obviously it's better to take no action and to let the oil degrade on its own. One thing we've learned over the years is that all oil spills are different and a cleanup approach that might work in one situation might not work in another. For example, in situ burning would be used in a grass dominated wetland with a uh, surface water buffer while uh, nutrient addition uh, could be used in a well drained high elevation wetland. So all cleanup options should be in the response toolbox, but the one chosen should be specifically tailored for the individual situation.